Howdy, and welcome to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. The Preaching Poetry Podcast uses poetry to inspire conversation and to rediscover the world. Let's get to it. Howdy. The poem we're going to be reading today is called Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. See, this poem is consisted of four major reflections. Okay, there's four little stanzas. Let's break those down real quick before we talk about anything else, okay? So, <clears throat> the first thing that we need to talk about is the part that talks about the unconquerable soul. So, out of the night that covers me, black is the pit from pole to pole. Now, night, that's pretty easy to understand. He's invoking this darkness. It's not a very happy poem. Um, But what does he mean by the pit? Okay, and some people will say, well, it's the pit of hell. Or, you know, the pit is just sort of a a, a euphemism for like a a grave or a hole in the ground they're going to bury him in. But I think the reference is to the pit of Tartarus, right? And so the pit of Tartarus... um, that's where you would you would go in Greek mythology if you were a particularly horrible person, um, not just a mediocre person, but if you were really bad, you got sent to Tartarus, and and that's where you would basically be uh, tortured forever in the afterlife. Um, and so, whether it's hell, whether it's Tartarus, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> he says that the night is as black as the pit. Um, this is not an optimistic poem. <laughs> we should definitely pick that up from the beginning. Um, and, and this night goes from pole to pole, a okay? North pole, South pole, the entire planet, the whole world, at least Henley's whole world is covered in darkness and hell and suffering. And there's no mercy. There's no relenting. There's nothing that's comforting here. It is all dark. And he says, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. And this calls, to my mind anyway, the idea of soul invictus, right? This is a Roman feast celebrating the uh, the unconquerable, undefeated son uh, made popular by the emperor Aurelian. And so... When I think about this poem, I think we need to pay attention to those sorts of allusions to the divine. Um, he's talking about the pit of Tartarus or the pit of hell, calling to mind mythology. Um, he's talking about the gods, but he's not mentioning them specifically. Um, there doesn't seem to be much respect, if any, towards these gods. Uh, we're not even really sure how much he actually believes in them. But what we do see <clears throat> is that he believes in himself. He believes in his unconquered soul. Now, we're not even going to get into how the idea of a soul is also kind of Greek mythology, uh, Platonism. Uh, But anyway, we get it. The first part of this poem sets the stage. This first reflection about the unconquerable soul is dark and hopeless, but resolute, right? And the resolute continues with the second stanza, right? He says, in the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. The fell clutch just means this is the uh, 
the, the dark, the bad, the evil. It's a fell clutch. The, the word fell there is talking about something that's evil, wicked, bad. Okay. So circumstances for him are not good. His life has not played out well. He has not come up spades uh, or come up aces. He's not, you know, he's not winning every hand that he plays. In fact, it seems like he tends to get more bad luck than good. Okay. But he is not wincing. He's not crying out. Um, And under the bludgeonings of chance, life seems to be pretty random and chaotic especially in that first stanza, but under these bludgeonings of chance, the beatings of chance, his head is bloody, but unbowed. So he does not bow. He does not um, tap out. He has not quit, but he is bloody. Okay. This is a, um, a, a pretty dark picture of a man. Doesn't seem like there's any hope. Doesn't seem like there's really much at all to go with. Um, but he's simply stubbornly refusing to surrender, even in the face of um, not just the gods that may be against him, but even his own luck, his own circumstances, his own chance seems to be working against him here. And then he goes on to talk about uh, beyond the place of wrath and tears, and, and that they'll, we will find him unafraid, right? So um, the shade, that doesn't mean... Um, shade from the sun, like you're sitting under a tree or on your porch. Um, that shade, okay, there uh, is the underworld, right? So the horror of the shade is death. Um, and death is this timeless enemy of mankind, right? We've been dying ever since we've been around. We've been afraid of death ever since we've been around. Um, and so here he is. He is not doing well. Um, and he, he seems to, to have death looming large in his mind, but he wants us to know that, uh, he is not going to be afraid. Okay. Even in the face of death, the menace of the years, right? Death will find him unafraid. So he is not afraid now and he will never be afraid. Now, there's no mention of any sort of an afterlife, which makes sense because he's basically already said that he is in hell. Um, And so he's hopeless, but he's not afraid. Seems a little bit odd to me. Um, And then the very last part, he says, it matters not how straight the gate, right? So that reference there, straight the gate, um, that's not talking about a line, like a straight line that doesn't, you know, bend or curve. Um, it's talking about uh, straight as in like the Strait of Gibraltar or the Strait of Panama. Um, the word straight means narrow, right? The narrow gate, right? And if you if that sounds familiar to you, the straight gate or the narrow gate, it's probably because, again... King James Bible. We talked about it a little bit last week, but uh, in the the King James version of scripture and the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that you should enter through the narrow gate. A broad is the path that leads to destruction. Enter through the straight gate. Well, that phrase is pulled directly out of the Bible. It doesn't matter how straight the gate. It doesn't matter how narrow the path is. Doesn't matter how charged with punishments the scroll is. More biblical language. The scroll is a big deal in Revelation, so the end of the world, judgment. Um, So he's anticipating judgment. He's anticipating not um, not making it through the straight gate and being judged. Um, But he says, it doesn't matter because I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Okay, and so um, you have the scroll of judgment. There's no mention of, you know, any hope of, of some sort of heaven or, um, you know, the, the book of life that doesn't get mentioned. Um, so his biblical references are all to like judgment, despair, destruction, death. And so this poem is pretty dark and pretty hopeless. And yet it is incredibly popular. Why is that? So this poem, Invictus by William Ernest Henley, is a 
cultural anchor in our society. It's a touchstone. It's quoted all over the place. Um, you can go look it up if you want, but it's quoted in movies. It's quoted in TV shows. It's quoted um, all over the place. Books. You know, the, the, this quote gets pulled up and out of context. You'll see it in like locker rooms and on stadiums. You know, I'm the I am the captain. I am the master. I you know we have that sort of we hold this poem up as this um, this this great example of self mastery, right? Of overcoming adversity, of staring death in the face, or staring these overwhelming odds, this overwhelming hopelessness in the face and and not giving up. And and poems like this by William Ernest Henley get this sort of reputation um, in this Victorian era, right? And we're going to talk in this podcast a lot about the Victorian era. Um, but, but this was a virtue in Victorian England, this stiff upper lip. The sort of, I'm going to endure... I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm not going to let difficulties, hardships, things like that stand in my way. I'm going to be a self-made man and I'm going to overcome the obstacles that are in my way. And so it's inspiring, isn't it? I mean, you read that and you're like, oh man, I want to be like that. No, I want to be the... The, you know, the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. I, I want that. You know, it's painted as this virtue of endurance. Um, and it's particularly, this poem in particular is held up as a, a masculine virtue, a manly virtue. You know, bloody but unbowed, beaten but never defeated. <laughs> it reminds me of a, a story my grandfather uh, he went to Texas A&M. I can hear you whooping. No reason to... If you don't know what that is, go look it up. Um, Texas A&M has a storied rivalry with the University of Texas. Um, not so much now. I could get off into the weeds. Not going to do that here. But essentially, when I was younger, uh, he he took me to games in College Station, watched them. We talked about Aggie football. It was something that we kind of bonded over. And he told me uh, one time that that the Aggies, that Texas A&M has never, ever lost a football game. And I looked at him like, what? What are you talking about? Never lost a football game. That can't be true. He says, well, they may have been outscored, but they never lost. <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever. All right, man, whatever you say. But that attitude, it's got that sort of manly virtue. It's that, you know, losing is a mindset. Defeat is a mindset. And that if you're a strong man, you can endure all of those things. And even if you get defeated, you still hold your head up high and you still face those things and you still keep marching forward. You never, ever quit, never give up. Right, indomitable heroes, and and it sort of calls to mind, um, you know, John McClane. You know, it doesn't matter how bloody his feet are from running across all that broken glass. He's going to continue fighting. He's outnumbered. He's outgunned. He's going to keep going. It, th this poem is like written for the the Western action hero, for Jason Bourne, right? <laughs> for John McClane. For Rambo. And so when we look at this poem, it's often held up to show us what we should strive for, what we should aspire to. But I think we have to ask ourselves the really big question here. Is this poem true? Because remember, when I said that this is a, a podcast where the poetry does the preaching, we might say amen but I don't think this is one of those poems where we can give ourselves an unqualified amen, yes, let's go get them. Because if you stop to think about it, how bloody can your head really get before you have to bow down or bow out? Or get knocked out? Okay? 
if you come to the end of your ability and you give it all your best and you still physically can't hold on, does that mean you failed? What about people who tried just as hard as William Ernest Henley, but got a little bit even less lucky than he did? You know, in a poem like this, we imagine the the hero who survives the whole movie to the end and overcomes the obstacle, but there's no guarantee of success here with this poem. Not at all. Because eventually, no matter how many punches you think you can take, eventually you're going to get knocked out. Right? Like, you're not going to be able to keep going forever and ever and ever. There comes a limit to everybody's ability to endure. And I don't think that we should hold up this sort of never-ceasing, unflagging, iron-clad will as the end-all be-all of what we aspire to. Now, don't get me wrong. I think mastering ourselves, enduring discomfort, persevering under trial, I think those are good virtues. But, I mean, for real. How has mastering your fate or captaining your soul worked out for you lately? (laughs) I've been trying to exercise more, trying to get stronger, trying to have better, you know, cardiovascular health, be able to run further, um, just trying to get in better shape. And boy, I can tell you, there's a limit. I can't go forever. I can't will myself to run because eventually my out of shape body is going to catch up to me. We all have those limits, right? So, Really, how far can the iron will alone get you here? Is it going to get you all the way to the end? I don't think so. I think this poem could be aspirational. Um, I think this poem could be something to use to motivate ourselves, to inspire us. But I don't know that this is a completely realistic picture of the way life should be. Okay, I really do enjoy this poem, but it falls short in a couple of really important ways. You see, resigning ourselves to screaming defiance as the pit overtakes us, that doesn't strike me as a noble thing. It just seems wasted. I do admire the determination to press on. I do admire that sort of dogged, never quitting, not giving up just because the stakes are high. But is every little thing you run into worth bloodying your head for? I don't think so. And while this poem may seem heroic, what it really is, is lonely. Very lonely. The analogy at the end, the captain, you know, he, he pictures, um, our fates and our souls as ships. Okay. And if that's true, if he is the master and he is the captain, William Ernest Henley is, well, where's the crew? One man alone can't sail a ship. So even Henley's analogy breaks down. Like, how can you be the master of your fate and the captain of your soul when a ship, just by the very nature of the analogy, requires people to hoist the sails, to trim them, uh, to to, to man the the rudder and the wheel, and to, to do all of the little things that you have to do to maneuver a ship around? One man alone can't do those things. So I admire the determination to handle our business, um, to endure discomfort, um, to attempt difficult things, even in the face of odds that mean we may not be guaranteed success. But I don't like this loneliness. You see, I think if you want to have a really good chance of sailing your ship through the straight gate, I think you need some other people around you. 
I think you may need a community of sailors. You, you're going to need some other people. Now, to be sure, I'm not saying that this poem is totally off. But Henley never mentions a friend here. He never mentions a confidant. He never mentions a counselor or a therapist. He never mentions a coach or a trainer. I can tell you if, if I am attempting to do everything on my own, I'm, I'm not going to eat healthy if I don't have some help. I'm not going to exercise every day if I don't have some help. I'm not going to be good at my job if I don't ever get some help and some coaching from other people who know what they're doing. You see, I would rather be a part of a crew working hard to achieve success than be the solo captain of a ship called my soul. I don't know. Maybe you'd agree. Maybe you'd disagree. But what I really hope that you can get from this poem, what you can take away is that you, you may want to examine yourself. Where is it that you need to, uh, to exercise a little backbone? Where are you maybe bowing down when you don't really quite have to yet? Are you giving up because your head is bloody? Well, if you are, maybe this poem can inspire you to move forward. But if you're trying to go it completely alone, I don't think that's going to work out very well for you. Thank you for listening to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed your time with us, and we look forward to having you back for more. If you like what you heard, please be sure to leave a review, and don't forget to subscribe. If you're looking for more content, you can find us on Apple, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, basically anywhere you find podcasts. If you want to join our community, or just want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Preaching Poetry. 